Okay, good morning everybody. So welcome to the Sex and History webinar today um, and that's part of the Sexual Health Week. Um, today, uh, my name is Sarah Tiffany, first of all, I introduce myself and I am one of the Youth Work Specialists for the National Youth Agency. And today you have um, two people presenting and that is Alice Hoyle and Alice is a sex education expert, teacher and youth worker and Professor Re Rebecca Langlands who is Professor of Classics for the University of, University of Exeter. So what I'll say to you guys, just a couple of things before, please mute yourself while people are speaking, if the ladies are presenting. If they ask you to unmute yourself, then go ahead. Um, we can't unmute you for GDPR reasons, so we will tell you to unmute yourself if you need to speak. Um, and yes, this webinar is gonna be recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel um, on the NYA's YouTube channel and also if you have a look in the chat I've popped in the chat a couple of little links firstly to do um, an evaluation for NYA secondly to do an evaluation for Alice and also the Padlet which Alice will talk more about as she starts to present okay off you go then ladies thank you brilliant cool um Sarah, can you pop the links in again? Because I actually can't see it. Was it in the waiting room? In the it may be, yeah. I'll copy them now and I'll pop them in for you. That'd be great. Thank you. Right, I'm going to share my screen just so we can uh, get started. Um, do, 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 do. There we go. Share. Hopefully this will work. Right, there we go. Okay, so um, yeah, as Sarah kindly introduced me, um, I'm Alice and I've been working on the Sex and History programme for quite a while and I'll let Rebecca introduce herself as well. If you're there. I'm Rebecca Langlands. I um, work at the University of Exeter, as Sarah said. And yeah, so together with some colleagues um, who work in history and classics, we um, do research projects on the, on the history of sexuality and the history of gender. And we've been working together for sort of, you know, 15, 20 years in this area. But over the last 10 years, we've started to um, see the value of uh, historical objects for um, thinking about sex and sexuality and particularly with young people. And quite a few years ago, I can't remember how many it is now, Alice, but we started working with Alice as a, an expert in the field of, of sex education. And so we've been working together on thinking about um, really making the most of this historical resource that's come out of our research. Cool. So I'm going to uh, move on. Sometimes my PowerPoint does not like to move on. Right. The very first thing I um, just wanted to do with you all is just get a quick uh, group agreement. Um, those of you who've come to the other sessions that I've done um, will have seen these four things. Oh, and I'm always moving too fast. So um, <laughs> it's just the idea of taking care of me, taking care of you, having an equal say and learning as we go. Um, just meaning, you know, looking out for yourself and what you share in the group. We're going to use the, the group chat quite a bit. Um, probably the easiest thing is if you do want to actually, um, you know, say either wave a hand or if you put, um, I don't know, two stars by whatever you type in the chat, we can come to you so you can sort of unmute yourself and um, contribute verbally as well because it's quite, quite a big group today. Um, taking care of you, obviously, you know, look out for each other, respect each other, etc. all the standard things. It is a bit surreal doing all this in Zoom when we can't sort of see each other face to face and read body language in the same way. Having an equal say, we're going to keep this one quite interactive. There's going to be um, hopefully lots of opportunities for discussion, either in the chat or actually talking. Um, and we're all learning together. You know, this is the first time we've done a sex and history session online. So it's all new to us as well but hopefully um, you will enjoy it. So I have got a close-up camera where I will be uh, using to show you, um, I'll just lift. So you can, if you see the close-up camera, when we come to that bit, if you want to pin that one so you can see um, in, in close-up what I'm gonna be showing you. Okay, I'm gonna hand back to Rebecca for this bit. <laughs> Okay, just to quickly go through the session aims so you know what we're intending for the next hour. So we want to just give you a, an idea of the approaches that we use within sex and history and a sense of why they might be, um, why they could be useful for you um, and familiarise you sort of quite superficially because we don't have very long but with the sex and history resources the kind of things that there are available um, and to kind of get you to think about and talk to us about how they could work with the young people that you work with in your in your work 
Um, and just at the bottom of this slide, you can see um, a nice little kind of display of various objects, intriguing objects. We won't have time to talk about any of them by any means, but what we're hoping as well is that if you are interested, if your interest is piqued during this session, um, you will feel free to follow up afterwards and i'm really happy for you to get in touch with me email me um, and have a um a one-to-one -one meeting or discussion afterwards and and one of the things we're hoping to begin to do in this session is to build your confidence in using these kind of historical objects to talk about relationships and sex education <laughs> so sorry about my powerpoint for some reason <laughs> i have no idea why it seems to take on a life of its own i don't press anything and it zooms past <laughs> things so apologies for that um, what we just wanted to do now is just a quick sort of confidence continuum. So sort of do a thumbs up. If you could turn your cameras on, that would be great. If not, just put in the chat if you can do a sort of thumbs up. But the first one is um, about, do you feel confident to, to talk about sex and relationships uh, with groups of young people? Have we got thumbs up or are we, you know, where, where are people? So there's, there's quite a few thumbs up um, going on. So that's lovely. And then the next one, when my thing decides to move on. Um, I can see how historical objects uh, could be useful for talking about sex and relationships with young people. So, um, uh, so yeah, a few not sure, a few thumbs up, brilliant. Um, that's great. I can't quite see everybody because I'm screen sharing and it's one of those if I press to see everybody suddenly I lose my screen. So I'm sort of trying to multitask but I've got a few thumbs up going on in the chat as well. Um, and yet again, my PowerPoints, oh, sorry guys, it's very <laughs> slick. <laughs> okay, so spoiler alert on the next slide. What I would like you to do in the chat is um, I'm gonna show you an object and I would like you to um, put in the chat, what is it, what might it be used for and what are the questions you have about this object? So having a look at the picture in front of you, what on earth is that? Chastity belts come up quite um, as first thing and view on the chastity belt. So what was it used for then? And any questions about the object? I mean, personally, I've got a question about the clover shaped thing at the back there, because that is going to make some interesting shape poo. Um, stopping penetrative sex, prevent women from having sex looks painful the hinge can you think about the hinge and clasping on pubic hair you know um is it real or fake that's a great a good question was it used for pleasure interesting um want to know what the teeth are for yeah oh yeah and quite narrow as well you know you couldn't fit anything through that so yeah some really fab questions okay i'm gonna i'm not gonna give you any answers because i'm mean um some mini version would make nice earrings love it now this, I'm going all high tech on you, hopefully, if it works. Look at this, I'm making it turn around. Um, so, what is this? Any ideas at all? What was it used for? And any questions about this object? A lava lamp, love it. <laughs> and I should be able to do a tilt the other way as well oh no it's not tilting it's supposed to tilt the other way oh a menstrual sponge two people embracing brilliant oh there we go i'm i'm going oh used for masturbation in some way so some kind of um sex toy maybe is it upside down does it look different when you look at it upside down suddenly it looks like dangling boobs or testicles or something um a few think people thinking use for masturbation in in some way i have actually got so just to to show you um if you can look on uh, my screen and actually i can probably pick this screen up and and do a bit more of a so this is a 3d printed version and you can get the pattern um on the url that um is at the bottom of the screen and it's on the uh, padlet that we've sent oh prosthetic testicles i love it um so yeah pe people can see two people now so yeah but you can get this 3d printed so you can have it as an object to start this conversation fertility charm interesting again not going to give you any answers because i mean but that that will uh, come a bit more at the end oh right let's move on to the next one okay what's this 
what was it used for and what other questions do you have about this object? So let's see what we're getting. Pleasure. <laughs> now you can't see on, on from the picture, but it's actually only about that big. It's, it's smaller than your thumb, okay? So just so, to give you a bit of a clue, a pendant. So it has got a hole on the end. Key ring, love it, decoration, brilliant. So we're still not sure what it was used for or when, when did it, you know, what period of time does it come from? What other questions have you got about this object? Fertility charm? Oh, what's it made out of? Yeah. A Roman charm? Looks bony. Yeah, it's quite long and thin and yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so those are three of the objects that we use in sex and history. Just to sort of pique your interest, so we're actually now going to um, move on. Um, Rebecca, do you want to talk first or shall I play the video first? Uh, I will talk first, just very briefly, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, um, sure. <laughs> just to introduce, so, I, so yeah, so those are, and you know, we will come back to these objects at the end of the session, but those are three of the objects that we do use in, in sex and history and they, um, come from um, well various different museum collections but you'll see that what they have in common is that they are ancient artifacts from a range of different cultures and, and time periods um, and that's the sort of foundation of the sex and history project and as I said a long time ago it kind of arose out of research we were doing into um, the way that sex and sexuality were um, you know, meant different things and were approached and represented differently in different cultures and we just started by finding that um, introducing these objects to young people, um, just the, you know, just showing them pictures or taking them to the objects was a starting point for amazing conversations. And we started in a very informal way, really just working with um, youth groups and teachers and just exploring it. And what Alice is um, about to show you is a little clip from a film that we made at one point, it was a few years ago now, maybe five years ago or something, um, where we just recorded a little bit of um, some, uh, some sessions that we did in the local sixth form college, so Exeter College in Exeter. Um, and you'll see, you'll sort of see what it might look like. It's a very informal kind of setting of, of the kids all sitting on the floor and, and they're using, they're not using actual objects, they're using pictures. So they're looking at, at photographs. So you can see the potential of that. And you've just got a couple of interviews with the teachers and with the um, students themselves, the young people themselves, just talking about what they got out of those sessions. So we thought that would be a helpful way of just sort of communicating to you the, the potential really. Um, so yeah, Alice, if you want to Go ahead. Right. And if you can just show me thumbs up that you can all hear it okay, because I'm always worried about my sound. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, my PowerPoint. I do apologise, everybody. Sorry. Okay. Won't touch anything. What's been going on this morning? We've brought um, the young people from the college to the university to have a look at some historical sexual objects um, and just discussing it in groups and getting their thoughts and opinions on them. They engage with them, they let their imaginations run and um, they didn't, I don't think they censored themselves. And what was nice is seeing them looking at the different language that they use to talk about sex and to talk about body parts. So some of them come in and, you know, they don't have that vocabulary or that language. So they can, it's a way of getting them to talk about it, look at words and, and hopefully removing some of their inhibition. It made me wonder how really liberal we are in our society today. Like, we think we're very understanding and, um, and liberal, but maybe we're not quite as much as we like, thought we were. What I found interesting was like learning about how open they used to be, rather than now it's all concealed and stuff. It's been quite uh, fascinating to see how other cultures have attitudes towards sexuality that we perhaps might see as progressive, but are in actuality very, very old attitudes. 
Um, well, today's session I found interesting the things that I hadn't necessarily thought about before, the way that our like culture in the West, um, like the things about body image. In different cultures, it's different the way women are presented and portrayed and stuff. Challenges only arise when they don't have anything to say and when they don't have any ideas, so it's nice that they have that stimulus to get them engaged and to give them ideas. And the more talking they do, the more ideas come out, the easier it is. It's informative on both a sort of historical level and it's uh, really raises some quite interesting thoughts with regards to sex and sexuality and their place in history and the human experience. I don't know, it's not like, it's not something that's really on the curriculum that necessarily we learn about in school and yeah, it was just really different, really different experience. Brilliant, okay, so um, let's just move on. Oh, you need to unmute yourself, Rebecca. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> amateur. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, obviously there, you, you'll see a kind of, you can see that the young people felt that there were various sort of things that it, that it, it opened up for them, various things they were able to discuss. And the teachers were using this as a way into doing sex education. So one of the teachers is saying, the difficulty is when you don't have, when they don't have anything to say and you've got these sort of awkward silences. And what, what we found was really good and working with those teachers and other teachers was really good is that the objects are a kind of slightly distanced um, uh, object that you could, that, that, that they just immediately want to start talking about and are excited to talk about. They don't have to reveal anything about themselves. They don't have to start talking about sexuality today, but inevitably they end up getting into um, things that are relevant today. So one brilliant discussion they had was all about pubic hair and the way that pubic hair was represented very differently um, in, different, in different images and it made them start reflecting on, on the way that um, pubic hair is, uh, is, is, is um, the sort of aspirations and expectations around that today and where they come from. Um, and yeah, so that, so one of the things to sort of stress in this in a way is that the, that the, the objects and the kind of questions, the way they're framed um, with questions that allow just open discussion to just go the way it is, is very much about um, creating a, a situation in which people can talk about issues um, in an indirect way. Um, and really the objects themselves are not the central point. So. Um, as we'll sort of say when we go on and talk about in the next, when we talk about, we take you through a particular um, aspect of the, um, a particular resource and object. Um, it doesn't matter really if the whole session doesn't really talk about the object at all after the beginning. If the kids end up speaking about body image and attitudes towards it or about sex and power or about gender expectations, that's the aim of the session. So, you know, it's, it's important not, the objects are really just there to open things up and they really do seem to work incredibly well in that way. Um, but, it, but the sessions can go in all sorts of different directions. So it's as much about what your young people or you want to talk about as anything else. Yeah. Is it, I mean, I don't know if anyone wants to ask any questions or if there's anything else I should say at this point or whether you want to. Keep going. comments on screen uh, which is about um you know from susie about working internationally much of the language of RSC is taboo this will be great for increasing confidence uh, sorry increasing comfort and that's exactly what we found that you know just using it it's sort of distancing because you're talking about the past so it's not part of you, they end do end up talking about their sort of lived experience but it, the starting point is in the past so it, it does feel um safer i'm just gonna um move on because we're i'm going to stop sharing my screen now um and if you can right so i ha i have to prep for this bit we're going to get you to experience a sex and history session and i have some lovely white gloves to put on to protect the object that i'm going to be um sharing with you um so i feel a bit like a, a magician or something at the moment so um if you would like to, um, so well, I'm going to hold it up to the camera here and then I'll bring my other camera in. So in the chat box, can you have a look at this? And I'll just get my other camera. So hopefully you can see it up close. What is this? Any ideas? I'll sort of move the camera around so hopefully you can get um, a good... A good look at it and if you want to pin the close-up camera so it becomes your main 
um, screen that that may Let's help. Let everybody know how to do that. If you go into um, the three dots at the top of the close up camera, um, you go into the three dots and it'll say pin. And if you want to pin that, an old fashioned Kiwi, I love it. Right. Um, to give you a bit more of a clue, there are actually two of these objects. So I'll get the other one out as well. Um, and it's a real shame you sort of can't see them uh, in real life because they are tiny. They're about 10 centimetres long. So um, a few people are saying shoe to bind feet. When you do this with young people, it's really interesting. They're all like an elf shoe, a fairy shoe, you know, all sorts of um, dif different um, ideas. So what, uh, what, where might they be from then? Have a few comments in the chat. <laughs> so we've got, yeah, China, Chinese foot bound shoe. Um, when, we, when we look at them, we also, with the kids, it's sort of, when might they have been made? Any ideas on when these might have existed? I'll try and do a, a close up on the camera, just let me. And just to kind of while, while Alice is doing that, just to say, so when, I mean, obviously these, these objects can be used in lots of different settings and Alice and I have both run sessions with them with young people. Um, often when I've done them, it's been a very informal setting and, and what's really nice is these are objects that we actually have and everyone can put on their white gloves and sort of pass them around and sniff them and look what they're made of and they're very beautiful. I mean, you probably can't quite see um <laughs> on the, uh, looking at it online but they're they're you know they're very intricate embroidery made of silk but they also look like they're worn so we often spend a bit of time just kind of looking at them and just really trying to sort of you know engage with them very closely um before beginning to to sort of think about what they what they might be um but i've um, got lots of good 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 answers or very very well informed answers <laughs> in the chat as well um so yes indeed these are shoes and one of the things that as Alice says you know that when that at first it doesn't seem possible to um usually when you're with even youth groups uh, when you say yes these are shoes that people wore and they're like what but they're so small surely they must be doll shoes or as you say like elf shoes or something um and then you know well are they ch for children no they're actually for adults um so yes, they are um, from China and they're probably 19th century. I mean, it's not clear when they are, but um, that, that's, it, 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 that's, that's the sort of best guess for the dating for those. Um, and then obviously then, as, as you, you, you guys are, no, are noting, the idea of, um, of, of the, the shoes are for a foot that has undergone foot binding, which was the Chinese, a Chinese practice among some ethnic groups in China. Um, until about uh, 150 years ago, 100 years ago. Um, so that's a sort of the, the sort of beginning of, of, you know, revealing a bit of historical information that then leads into um, beginning to think about the implications of that and why that might happen. So then, then obviously, you then need to talk about like how how would a foot fit into that shoe? Um, do, do you guys know anything about foot binding? What what happens in it or how, how people <laughs> manage to have feet that, that fit into such a tiny, tiny shoe. It's a very, yes, but foot, feet bound from a very young age. That was one of the things of about seven years old. Um, girls, not boys. So that's another thing. So it's important that this is the shoes that girls would wear. Um, so immediately we start thinking about kind of gender expectations. Um, and we've got a nice image that we can show you if we have time that shows very clearly the difference in expectation between male and female feet. Um, and, you know, it's a really horrible, exactly horrible, brutal process. Um, the bones were broken and the feet were sort of pushed together and they were bound up to stop them from growing um, and they were bent backwards. Um, so that it was very difficult to walk. Um, and so then the next set of questions to get people, young people thinking about is, why would someone do this? Um, why would someone um, choose to do that to their daughter? Uh, why might a daughter choose to have it done to them? Um, what would the benefits to be? Why, why you know, how, how, what's it all about? And obviously there are lots of different answers that you can give to this, but 
Um, I mean, I don't know if you if you want to sort of try and give give some answers now, but certainly when again, and Alice, you can you know talk about the kind of things that have come out of your sessions. But you know, it's it's a really interesting um, set of questions to think about for young people in relation to their understandings, exploration of parent child relationships, and what decisions parents make on behalf of their children. So that's one really interesting set of discussions that come out. But ideas about expectation exactly so it's more it you know the the small feet are seen as beautiful and then you have to sort of think about how you know unbound feet so feet um natural natural feet um that we like we might think were are beautiful today would be considered ugly and huge and and sort of un um <laughs> unacceptable in some way so you know you might think i would never do that you know some people say i would never do that to my children i could never do that you know natural feet are beautiful they're like yes but what if you live in a culture where your daughter is not going to be able to get married and what if that's the only ex you know the only um acceptable route or economically viable um life choice for a girl um so so there's lots of sort of discussions about the kind of things that you have to do that you do to your body in order to fit in in order to um in order to fulfill the roles that society expects um the idea of of, of different gender relations um there's a question about geisha traditions in there that's it's different because they're that that that's from um that's a japanese tradition but um yeah so exactly they're they're sort of horrible it's a horrible brutal experience but at the same time there's lots of kind of good reasons that you need to talk about for why um those choices might have been made and choices that feel really difficult and um and completely unthinkable to us actually make sense in different cultural settings um say that again yes exactly so how do young people respond to so i'm just reading the chat here how do young people respond to an object that sits in a culture outside of theirs has this been contrasted with corsets? Yes. So, and then another question, Sophie's asking is, is this, does this lead to a conversation about race as well? So that, that's quite a few different things. But yes, yeah, so that the, almost inevitably, this starts a conversation or leads to a conversation about body modification and treatment of bodies and cult within cultural expectations. And whether even though you know our initial in, in, instinct is like horror and you know people can't walk and it's incredibly painful um actually are there things we do today or are there things in other cultures that seem more sort of familiar um that are, are quite similar in some ways so people often start talking for example about high heels in contemporary culture today totally acceptable totally normal unbelievably painful <laughs> and obviously not quite as bad as foot binding because you can walk in them and some people don't find them as painful as me but my bunions are terrible um but certainly a way you know it doesn't make sense in practical terms really to wear high heels um but yes corset exactly we've got some really nice so we've got lots of materials around this um uh that alice has got on the powerpoint that we can kind of have a look at if we want to and if we have time but um exactly the, the the one of the slides has a whole series of things about corsets and obviously the idea about kind of taking one of your ribs away because narrow waists are so fetishized um and so lots of comparable material from other cultures and in terms of thinking about race it's obviously really important not to um stigmatize non-western or any any other culture i mean that's part of the kind of part of the point of the sort of being of these being historical materials is that it slightly guards against that but obviously what you don't want to get into a thing is like oh god aren't the aren't the chinese really weird practicing these awful things i mean that's absolutely not what it's about at all there's a, it's really important to frame it in terms of thinking about every culture having expectations and um and and being and you know the, the enlightening thing is understanding that we also have them but they just seem normal to us often and we don't step outside and criticize them um just we've got at this point rebecca if yes. it's, all right um so i i did this with a girls group locally and um there was a a girl in the group who's i think her great grandmother had had her feet bound and we did a, a just very short bit of work with the young person beforehand just to check in and sort of explain that what we were going to do and and that in this case they were so excited to do this work so they were so interested in finding out more about their own heritage and um it was really really interesting going through the understanding and and the political 
perspective and I'll get Rebecca to explain a bit more on that because it was um, actually ended up being a, a, a form of demonstrating political resistance um, because it was, uh, and I'm going to get this wrong, Rebecca, can you do the political resistance yes. bit? But it was I mean, really powerful for that young person to hear about that perspective of it as well. So th there are different ways of approaching it. So I'll hand back to Rebecca. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, I mean, obviously, we, and we again, we have some, uh, some information, some quite basic information on this in, in the PowerPoint, but it's, it, it's, it was a practice that was um, practiced by a particular ethnic group within China, which is the Han Chinese, which were a minority um, group and actually um it was sort of it was very culturally um, valuable for them as a form of sort of cultural resistance against the manchu chinese who were the um the the dominant um and, and, and oppressive um group in some ways so um i mean and, and and the other thing is this is something that sort of although it was practiced until relatively recently it has a very very long history so going right back i mean certainly um Sort of you know several hundred years so yeah so it's it's so it's also important to sort of see it as it's not just you know it's not just a blanket kind of chinese practice it's something that's particular to a particular ethnic group and has a value and and i'm sure and so one thing that um one sort of contemporary issue that can can come out of discussion here is talking about fgm um in 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 our in our cultures today so i think so it, so it, you know that 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 sort of cultural sensitivity is really important and not um you know sort of hold, holding a sense of, of of respect and understanding for other cultures is something that you know absolutely need to think about the other thing is um that um uh, there's a really nice on the powerpoint i we could maybe go to the the um, the poem alice i can't remember what what um that's one of the things if i see if i can find what um thing it's on one of the one of the really nice bits of evidence that we have so we've got lots of little kind of bits and pieces about this but one of them is um this lovely um is pet slide 22 <laughs> um is a lovely poem that is a um is an 18th century poem and it's written from the perspective of a woman who is anti-foot binding so it's also really helpful for kind of reminding us that again cultures are not monolithic and not everybody in the culture can you know subscribes to the same ideology and that you can have resistance um within cultures as well and yeah this so it's really if everyone can everyone see that um it's written in the 18th century by a woman who refused to have her feet bound and her poem is um three inch bowed shoes did not exist in olden times um, and Bodhisattva uh, Guanyin had her feet bare to be adored. I don't know when this custom began. It must have been invented by a despicable man. <laughs> and I really love that as a way into thinking about, firstly, the sort of idea of, you know, the possibility for change in culture. And I like the way that sh she in this, even though it's hundreds of years before the customs actually banned, she's thinking about the way things can change. And I think that can be quite inspiring for young people as well when they feel um, restricted by expectations for them, the sort of sense that you know you can rebel against expectations and things actually change, um, and also the idea of the kind of gender politics. You know, actually, often people, you know, sometimes people need to feel that need to conform, and sometimes they they you know feel like it's the right thing for them, but other people really don't. And again, there's space for that within cultures. So that's a really nice, um, uh, a really nice bit the of young uh, people uh, like. So I, I've done this with Year Six groups as well, which was really really interesting because they were sort of you know they're just on that cusp of being tweens and starting to um really feel a lot more peer pressure about appearance and all of that sort of thing and so interesting to unpick with them about the pressures to conform and we ended up with talking about um ear piercing or you know and um and particularly for that age group actually they're very interested in the parent angle because it would have been parents making the children do that but out of love for their child because they wanted their child to be able to marry a rich hus husband so there's also lots to unpick around status because um and on the padlet just to say i have included a video there's a lovely video clip on um it's a bbc bite-sized video clip with um an interview with the only um uh, someone who'd had foot binding but who was actually from a poorer uh, background but they actually used to bind their feet to, to try and achieve similar status um, and it's just a really interesting video clip uh, to watch with the young people as well so there's lots of sort of resources to 
explore and unpick with the young people on this. <laughs> Is there anything you want to add, Rebecca, on? Um, no, I guess, I mean, it, it might be useful to, to, to sort of turn it over to everybody else and see what kind of themes they think it might, you know, might kind of come out of these, this object for the young people that they work with. I don't know if that's what we want to move on to that. Yeah. Um, so, um, hang on, I think I have a slide on this. It's just a case of me finding. <laughs> do, 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 do. Slide 16. Oh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so, um, oh, actually, I've changed some of the oh, changed it, numbers. Sorry. I, I moved it somewhere else, <laughs> helpfully. Um, so yeah. we do have a PowerPoint as a backup for people, um, which is more just that sort of background historical information and, and pointers. But obviously in a youth setting, you might not really want to do a PowerPoint. I just print it out and have have the questions um, but does um, oh yeah so we've got here a link someone's mentioned uh, a link to celebrity waist trainers and Instagram filters so there is lots to um, unpick on different areas so these are some of the themes that that I've kind of picked out that I've ended up discussing but I don't know if anyone can think of specific questions that might come from young people around the practice of foot binding or around the shoes um, that you know the, the, the young people might be asking or, or questions that you have as well I don't know if um, yeah feel free to type them in the chat if you if you have got questions and we'll we'll see where we go on our discussion so there's a comment around yeah really interested about body modification generally um, oh, I've not heard of Megan Barton Hansen. So, Sophie, I don't know if you want to say anything more about Megan. You can unmute if you'd like to share anything. I can't actually see you, Sophie, so I don't know if you're shaking your head frantically going, no, thank you. <laughs> Megan from Love Island. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's really interesting is is the when you you know like body modification is a nice is it a good and neutral term because obviously that that that's one of the really good discussion points about you know when is when when do we modify ourselves when does that feel like the right thing to do it we, you know it's empowering it's something we want to do and when does it feel like something we're doing because we're forced into it and kind of where's the balance and do do you sometimes is it almost like you you almost sort of can't tell which side you're falling on in some ways um yeah, well, circumcision obviously is is a is a very widely practiced um, form of body modification, as is shaving. Um, <laughs> slightly different, you know. I mean, the, the one of the things that's really good to have a discussion is like wh how we how we feel differently about different kinds. And one area that I one issue that I've talked about quite extensively with young people is tattoos, um, which obviously are kind of you know. <laughs> painful potentially short in you know for the short term um and and perm, permanent or semi-permanent form of body modification but you know they talk about like why does that feel different and like how does that you know why why do some feel good and some feel bad so i think that's a really not really interesting area to talk about and the notion of uh, fashions as well is is really um interesting so this practice actually lasted for about a thousand years so when you're sort of thinking about sort of fashions it was it was quite an enduring thing it died out um i think it was the early 1920s is that right rebecca 1911 i think it was outlawed but then it took a long time to die out in the more rural communities where there was sort of less education and so on is is my understanding is that right rebecca yeah and yes exactly so there, eventually it was it laws were passed about against it but it had already sort of begun to you know the, the cultural expectations had shifted and one of the things that's really poignant and again a really nice I mean nice <laughs> a, 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 a fruitful thing to talk about is like how it felt to be those last women um who have these um feet that are no longer fashionable and considered beautiful and to have like undergone all of that pain and then find yourself in a different you know in a, in a culture that's that practices and understands things differently which is really the video i mentioned that it has this interview with this woman who's one of was one of the last women um i think um the last woman who had her feet bound has died in the last few years so um i don't think there are any women today who have still have their uh feet feet bound um and um yeah, Sophie, just say a bit more about Megan from, I didn't realise Megan was from Love Island. Do, do feel free to unmute yourself and, and say 
Sorry, I just couldn't, I couldn't find myself on the thing to unmute. Um, we just did a session. So Megan was a Love Island contestant a couple of years ago. And um, she has had a lot of body modification, plastic surgery, breast enhancement, etc., And had some like sort of fairly uh, criticism in the media around her discussions of that. But she, she talked about it relatively confidently in comparison to other forms of body modification, even something as simple as makeup, but also semi-permanent makeup, hair dye. And we're sort of saying, I don't see the difference between these things, which is a quite a bold position, not necessarily one everyone would agree with, but we did, I did a session where we took all forms of body modification I could think of and did it on a scale of okay for me, not okay for me okay for anyone not okay for anyone and one of the really interesting conversations that was the difference between breast uh enhancement breast reduction and gender reconforming top surgery mm -hmm. and that discussion all these different ways that we can interact with breast surgery and someone even mentioned as well breast removal for breast cancer and the difference between that and top surgery and um it didn't, it wasn't, it didn't always go that well, the session in terms of there was a lot of everything is okay for everyone always. And you sort of wanted to push people a bit and be like, is, is, is that the, do you really think that, you know, everything is always okay? But there was lots of those comparisons, which I don't know, it was interesting. And like Megan spoke on it very, like she was quite strong on it. I think she may have retracted some of those positions now. Um, and also Love Island changes so quickly, like she's not relevant really anymore. Um, but at the time it was, it was really interesting. That she's sounds fine. brilliant. I love the, the grid idea as well of, um, yeah, unpicking that. And it is that kind of, where are we on the spectrum of body modification in terms of what harm does it cause? Is it permanent? Is it semi-permanent? That all, all of that stuff to unpick. Um, sometimes there can be parallels as, as well with, um, cultural practices such as FGM. Um, so, you know, that you then move on to, to conversations about that. What I found with the sort of year sixes is they've not tended to unpick it sometimes because I try and keep it where, what they're bringing to the session and we go oh, yeah. down the routes um, that they're, they're going on. Um, and it is uh, fascinating. Oh yeah, so we've got some other things um, people are saying about interesting discussing in relation to drag. And, and creating different gender norms and challenging these and talking about purposes of female sexual pleasure, something called purling, which is beads being inserted under the foreskin. So I've learned something new. <laughs> Didn't know about that as a, a, a thing. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting what can come up for people and different avenues that you can explore with this. Um, I think I'm actually going to show you, we've, we've got about 20 minutes left and I just want to show you a picture. Um, this is another thing we use in sex and history. Um, hold on. So of this picture that you can see now, oh, and I've moved it on, spoiler alert. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything you can notice about this picture in relation to the stuff we've been talking about? or just in general about this picture. What's going on? Again, let's do the question. What is this? So While you're looking at it, I could say that um, it's, uh, this is a, again, a very small object about six inches, which is 10 centimeters as well, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, that we, so a few years ago, um, five years ago, my colleagues and I put on an exhibition of some of these objects in the museum here in Exeter. And this was one of the objects that we displayed and we made our poster for the exhibition of this object and hung it on the outside of the museum in the high street. And the BBC tried to whip up a kind of <laughs> scandalous furore around this and suggest that it was, and they interviewed people on the street saying, how do you feel about children being able to see this image? It's carefully, I think you can just about well, because you've got gender neutral here, but, um, if you actually look at the object, there is a penis, <laughs> but just one penis. <laughs> so th th this is actually an act of penetration and it's, it's really, it's made of ivory and it's really intricately carved and you can see, I think you can just sort of almost see it, but how can you, I mean, that's one thing to say. So we've got gender neutral males, but then you've got feet bound. Um, Eve, can, I don't know if you want to unmute and just point out where the feet 
what about what you can see about the feet band Maybe um that's... yeah the the person on the bottom um you can see that the shape of their feet you can tell that they've been bound yeah and the other person you can and it's this is a really nice this is the image i was saying that it gives a really nice contrast isn't it because you can see that the person on top has got unbound feet you can see their toes and their heels and everything so that's how you can tell that although it's really nicely gender neutral in some ways and good for talking about gender differences and, and similarities that actually these are gendered as male and female even when you can't see the genitals do you have any idea what this object might be used for Feel free to type in the chat if you've got any ideas at all. Education on penetration. So this object, I love this. I mean, it's tiny. When you see it in real life, it's really quite small. Um, wedding night instruction. So this, um, it's also known as a trunk bottom. And the, the theory is that it would have been um, put in the trunk on a wedding night as a sort of, this is how boys and girls fit together or something like that. Um, men and women fit together, sex, sex education instruction. Um, and I think one, one thing um, that I love about the object is when you're just using the image of the object, um, does it change if you were to turn the object upside down? What does that say? You know, suddenly the woman's on top or if they're sort of upright, you know, suddenly you're having a, a slightly different conversation you can move move the objects around i'll hand back to rebecca for any more historical <laughs> elements well i was going to say as a historian my my job is to say actually we, we really don't know anything about history at all <laughs> and and it is the case so alice has said you know some people have thought this could be what is called a trunk bottom but actually nobody really knows and that's what's really exciting about a lot of these objects is we don't really know what this is it's your guess is as good as ours and the young people's guesses as well i mean obviously there are some things we can say and again this is 19th century again it's chinese um oh they do look happy i mean and it's it's a, it's a really beautiful thing and it and you know you might say education but that kind of makes it sound kind of dry doesn't it it's a beautiful and quite potentially like an arousing or sort of inspiring object that makes it look like sex could be quite nice um but as alice says you know one of the things we've used it for i get taking it away from the historical angle of things is just thinking about representation of sex and it really makes a difference if you stand them upright it looks like they're having sex standing up what are our cultural associations around that um do we think of that as being a kind of you know quick and dirty sex around the, down the back of an alleyway. Whereas if the man's on top, that tends to be a representation of the kind of ideal, you know, sort of marital sex. And then if the woman's on top, then that's something else. So I think there's some, some things about the representation of the sexual act that are really interesting to talk about. Yeah. I also just wanted to pick up on something that Sophie was saying before when you were talking about Megan, because you were talking about the way that it was difficult, like, you know, some people were saying everything's fine, everyone should be able to do whatever they want to with their bodies, and then some people were saying not. And I think that's one of the ways in which bringing in historical material can be really helpful, because actually it's quite hard to argue that it's okay for, I mean, it's quite hard to argue that in the face of, of foot binding, and especially because there's some really shocking pictures of people's feet and you know and, and so I think it that really helps because obviously with our own culture it's often really hard to get it's hard to get a perspective but also we don't want to be and it's a good thing that we're not we don't want to be kind of moralizing or drawing absolute lines but it's it, it makes it makes it easier to be kind of more um open that to that kind of discussion when you're not talking about your own culture but when you're looking at things from the outside so i think that's that's something that i was thinking when you were talking and you can really unpick consent as part of that because what it comes down to is consent and bodily autonomy and also are we truly consenting if our entire culture has that expectation that everybody has big boobs or has their ears pierced or whatever the the thing is you know can you truly consent to to be like that um so we've got about 12 minutes left and um i'm going to uh go back to the examples that we um saw at the start so we've sort of given you a taster of the the foot binding session we can give you the powerpoint as well which has some slides and images as well that just help spark the conversations and the and the questions 
um, and some photos of the foot binding. These are the only shoes that we have, which I was terrified I was going to spill coffee on early. <laughs> I have to look after them. Um, but, uh, you know, we can um, come in to your setting to do that. I just also want to just do a very quick note on um, age for the sessions. I mean, obviously, you know, your young people that you're working with. Um, but just to say to, you know, when this is on YouTube to anyone watching, we're not saying do this in primary schools. I mean, some of this, I wouldn't use uh, the image that I've just shown you with the primary schools. I would use the shoes with primary schools, but it is always about that age appropriateness and age and stage, you know, making sure you know your learners and, and, and what you're going to be talking about. So I'm just going to flag that at that point. Right. Let me just go. Um, hang on. I will stop sharing. Oh, oh, my chat is in the way. So let me just find the right place in my PowerPoint. Bear with me a moment. Um, so, do, do, do. and now my PowerPoint's not moving on. Oh, right, here we go. Right, we're back to there now. Now I need to try and share it in the right place. Bear with me a moment. Oh, and Zoom just. Oh, everyone's disappeared on me. Right, that's helpful. Share screen again. Here we go. Share. Okay, right. So, um, so for the first one, um, the chastity belt. Um, yes, people were right about it was a chastity belt. And what, what we do with this one, and we do have video clips of this one, so you can watch, um, I think, is it Rebecca and Kate, I think, uh, doing that one. And there's some videos of Jen as well, who's another colleague who works on the project, um, explaining that although, um, yes, they were chastity belts. Well, actually, I'm going to let Rebecca explain it because she's going to do a better job than me. Um, so go on, Rebecca, you explain the sneaky history of chastity belts. <laughs> Except she's on mute. I'm on mute, sorry. Um, I, I mean... <laughs> Obviously, it's a chastity belt. And I mean, I say that most of the sort of useful discussion around this, I mean, this is a brilliant object that we've had some really, really great discussions around. And obviously, the main things that we talk about are things like control, who controls whose sexuality, why is chastity valued? Again, there's huge gender um, discrepancies, because this is obviously, supposedly a belt that a girl would wear. And just to kind of, um, just to sort of explain as well, it's a bit confusing, because actually, this is the kind of gus metal gusset bit and where the padlock is there that, that they those two bits shouldn't be locked together they should be apart and then there's a belt that goes round. um so it's that's not as it would be i mean you can see it, but you can't imagine how you'd wear it there um there's there's lots of really interesting things you can do with it but what the on the question of like is it fake or real again not clear so but Chastity belts are very much associated. Do, that, do people know like what period of history chastity belts are associated with? I don't know if that's something that, um, I mean, that again, that's something that you would, uh, um, yeah, mi mi the mi mi Middle Ages, the mid medieval Europe and the idea of the, um, uh, of, of pe people going away on crusades, um, leaving their wives behind. This is definitely not a medieval artifact. Um, and it, it, it could, I think in some museums they, they, they describe it as being from the Renaissance, but they look much more like they're made in the 19th century. And it, it often, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a whole line of, of scholarly thought that says that, um, that actually the kind of idea of the chastity belt is more of a sort of later invention. Like it's a sort of fetishizing idea about how the people in the middle ages controlled, um, their wives or their daughters. And actually it's more of a kind of fantasy idea potentially obviously in some cases it's actually kind of a sexual sexual fantasy sex toy kind of element um this doesn't look like something that would you could practically use um really i mean <laughs> it looks like it would be well incredibly dangerous <laughs> uh, uh to your health and ex extremely uncomfortable so yeah the idea is that the the concept of the chastity belt is real and so we can talk, it can help us to talk about chastity, but the object itself is probably um, in some ways, I don't know, fake's the right word, but it's it's not exactly kind of relating to the whole, the, the, the historical idea of the chastity belt. I don't know if that's helpful. So, so that resource we have written up in full and the link is on the Padlet. So um, go and have a look through and the, it takes you through the historical reveal and the questions to take on your discussion. Yeah. 
So this next object um, that we sort of thought might be, there were some suggestions it was linked to fertility. This is um, the Ain Thackeray Lovers, which is an object that's in the British Museum. So if you ever take a group of young people to the British Museum, go and see this. This is about the right size of it. Um, and it's the earliest known representation of uh, a couple making love is how the British Museum has, has phased it. And this is phrased it even. This is um, an object that can really get some really good discussions going. You know, is it uh, a man and a woman, two men? You don't know the genders of the people. What about the embrace? You know, it's quite an intimate embrace. Um, in, from some angles, people say it looks phallic um, and others, you know, less so. Um, so, sort of, you know, when it was hanging upside down, is it testicles? You know, there's lots of um, conversations that can be had from this object. This, um, the British Museum has got um, resources around doing sex education with this particular object. So you can actually go and see it or you can print a 3D version of it to start having that conversation. Um, it was uh, 11,000 BC, I believe. Um, and um, yeah, from the Nantufian culture and it was possibly a fertility symbol. But just the sparking conversation about um, couples and pleasures and things um you know is is brilliant then the last object the um necklace was a small phallic amulet um worn in roman times by children um as a way of warding off evil spirits um which is you know we sort of think oh penises yes they were everywhere in roman times and um yeah it was it was I think soldiers might have worn it to war for war as well. Is that right, Rebecca? Yeah, so this is, I, I'm actually a, a Roman, a classicist Roman historian. So this is kind of my, well, part of my area of expertise. And there's a, there's lots of really interesting stuff about the representation of penises in ancient, uh, in ancient, in the ancient Roman world, which re again, really gets people interested in kind of how different their uh, understanding of cultures. And I, and I like the fact that when we had the exhibition, we had, um, we made some of these little phallic amulets and my colleague Kate had uh, then um, quite small children and she made them and had a beautiful photo of her three children wearing these like penises around their necks and um, which we put on display in the museum as well um, but it's it's really it's quite it's nice because it's quite challenging to us because we tend to think of genital male genitals in particular well actually no it, it, almost more female genitals but we tend to think of genitals as being quite taboo and we certainly think of them as like you know not something that children should um, be associated with despite the fact that obviously all children have genitals <laughs> um, so it's it's that's quite a nice thing but yes, the idea of them as being uh, the idea of sort of them as being something that wards off evil is also and, and, and protects the person who's wearing them is also really interesting and gets you thinking about kind of what sort of power sex seems to have and how, you know, what the what how we think about penises and what the what their role in society is. Um, did the Romans have vulva jewellery? Um, so, I mean, I don't know if that they didn't have vulva am amulets of this kind. Now we do have some really nice um, vulvas from antiquity, but um, <laughs> ancient penises, my specialist subject, yes. Um, but vul but um, what, what the vulvas tend to be, um, I mean, there are loads of them, but they tend to be used in this um, religious medical context where people um, would make body parts and then um, give them in at the, at the temple, they would, um, uh, what's the word consecrate them to the god um of healing or medicine or various kind of gods to say you know if they had something maybe it might be to ask for fertility or it might be because they had something wrong with them so we do have loads of i mean that's another thing we have lots of really nice vulva representations i think i've um, got an image of it on this last one somewhere there the, the... oh yeah so on the left on the left there that's a that's a votive votive that's that's the that's the technical word that you you but you give it to the god as a votive votive vulva from italy and then yeah on the right hand side we've got this is this is really one of my favorite objects which is this lovely little clamshell really really small clamshell um again from china and it just has this fantastic representation of female genitals lots of pubic hair really great discussion to start a, um, for thinking about um, you know the, the representation of genitals and how that seems very shocking to us. Yeah so it's all closed up so you can't see it as anything and oh, yeah. then when it's opened yeah. up it reveals yeah. this so it just looks like a clamshell and then suddenly 
it's is it pornography is it art there's a lot a lot to discuss we're almost out of time so what i'm just going to quickly do um is go back to our confidence continuum and if you could just show me sort of um thumbs up on the last one um do well actually no i'm sorry i forgot i changed the first one too so i feel confident to try uh, talking about relationships and sex using historical objects with young people how are you all feeling on that front some some thumbs up i've excellent <laughs> And I want to try um, doing a sex and history session with young people. So few, few more thumbs up. I like, I like the sign of somebody who isn't sure, but wants to try, that's perfect. And just on that, I, I've said this in the chat, but I'll just say it again. And I've also said it on the Padlet. I'm really, really happy um, if, for people to contact me. I mean, I really encourage it to, for you to email me um, after the end of this session and I, I'm happy to set up a one-to-one -one session or if there's a number of people who are interested in the same thing I'm happy to run a an informal sort of you know meet like hour or something just talking through more things or if you just want to send emails quit questioning it um, I would love to you know to keep in touch with people who are interested in using the resources and um, give you more you know a more of an opportunity to talk through things in more detail because we've really like bombarded you with loads of stuff so please do feel free to do that. So I'll, I'll just stop sharing now, but if people could um, fill in the um, survey, feel free to go onto the Padlet and add any more questions or anything um, that you want or need from that or, you know, email us. Um, and I hope that session was useful for everybody and interesting and yeah, it was really fun to do. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for all your contributions and, and feedback and questions and everything. That's really, that's really good. Well, thank you, ladies. Thank you very much. That was really informative. Really enjoyed it. Um, guys, just a quick reminder. I've popped it in the chat. Uh, please give us your feedback. NYA would like your feedback also. Um, and I've popped in the link for the Padlet in there too. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Right. Take care, everyone, and enjoy your weekends and have a good Friday and things. So, yeah, all good. Right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye.